Welcome to the Not in the Job Description podcast. I'm Scott McLaughlin. And I'm Chris Kiernan. Look at all the people around you. They may seem very different, but they all have something very much in common. Work. Most people have had a history of roles that's taken them to their current job. Everybody has a story about their job and how they got there. We'll explore funny, gross, embarrassing, scary, and sometimes almost unbelievable stories that people have experienced at their jobs. So enjoy the conversations as people share things about their jobs that were not in the job description. On today's show, we talked to Rena Friedman Watts. Hi, Rena. Hi. Hey, Rena. Hey, how are y'all? Great. Um, you know, this is normally the part where I say, this is Rena, and she does, and I fill in the blank, but honestly, I- I've, I've read a lot about you. Um, I don't know that I can put one thing that you do because you've had such a great background of experiences. I was hoping that you could, uh, even for the just for the audience, tell us how you started off in your just your general work. Yeah, it's funny because I was just thinking about how I would describe myself as one thing. And I've been a producer of many things. I've been a producer of television. I've been an insurance producer. I've been a producer of the home. I'm a mom of four. How I got my start was I went to a, a youth performing arts school in high school and that led to me then auditioning for a radio station in Chicago. So I thought I wanted to work in radio. I worked for an NPR station in college, but I didn't get the job. And while I was up there in Chicago, I saw that Jerry Springer was looking for interns on the same trip. So I walked across to NBC Tower and started an internship there two weeks later. That's awesome. That's great. You know, um, Jerry Springer is is kind of a not totally local to us. I mean, we're in central Ohio. He was in Cincinnati, Ohio, a couple uh, hour and a half south of here. But uh, what a character. How long did you work with Jerry Springer? I was there about two and a half years. So it was a good training ground for entering into the entertainment industry. Yeah, I'll bet. Now, you know, it, it's funny. We talked about you know, if, if you get involved in a certain type of work. Uh, I know, for example, a lot of my history, I was in the fraud world. And so now, you know, it sounds like it's a really sexy thing. But trust me, when you're doing it, it's just a job. It's just what you're doing. You had to have that type of experience with Springer. Can you tell me, like, what was the first situation that you kind of threw you for a loop or you just thought, I cannot believe we're about ready to sc- to discuss this? Oh, man. I mean, working there, there was a lot of those moments. I would say even thinking about being on this show where it says not in the job description, one thing that came to mind was, we had a tranny that was going to be on the show, and then I was supposed to help tape the private part up before <laughs> he was out on the stage. And, you know, I was a young 20-something-year-old, like 21, 22-year-old, and I was kind of small town and sheltered and never had done that or seen that before. And that felt a little bit beyond the call of duty. Right. Yeah, so, that's hazard pay right there. And that was before that type of thing was even mainstream. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. And too, just being asked to, you know, take somebody into my office and make sure that that was once the other sex. I kind of just sat there and paused and I think my eyes probably about fell out of my head. I couldn't believe I was asked to do some of those things. All of that for $5 an hour, right? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So it definitely turned into a job. There were other things too, where you know, the stories would run into each other because we put different guests at different hotels and one story would talk to another story and then the story would happen in the street and then you're having to talk people into still doing it on the show or facing each other on the show. And the night before, you're like having to deal with the police or them getting kicked out of the hotel or just, you know, throwing stuff out of the hotel. I mean, my God, we had to switch hotels so many times. Okay. Now now I'm really intrigued, okay? So I, I know people who've worked on reality shows like television and things like that. And I don't want to say they're fake, but I want to say that sometimes um, – maybe not fully cooked, but they're at least simmered, right? Like they, they, there's some things that are made up because hey, this is going to be good TV. Are you telling me you had a lot of people where, you know, you really had to have security there because people were seriously yeah. being violent? Oh, I only went for those kind of stories. They're <laughs> much easier to produce. If something is really going on, then you don't even really have to push them very far to make the stories unfold. You just kind of have to remind them of what they forgot to say. But, you know, if you have a married couple 
and you have some chick that's been banging on the door for two and a half years, like messing with their family, that wife wants a piece of her. And right. so, yeah, I really tried to bring those kinds of stories because it just made my life a lot easier. Where it got harder was, to be honest, where sometimes we would bring a prostitute to the show or a stripper to the show and they talk a big game on the phone, but then they see the live studio audience and they get scared and understandably so. But I'm like, hey, what happened to that chick that didn't care at all what people thought and (laughs) were yelling and screaming at me on on the phone? What do you need to do right now to get back to that place? Right? Like, do you need a shot of something? Like, did you bring anything? (laughs) So that felt also beyond the job description, right? I, I heard other people needed a trip to the methadone clinic. I didn't even know what that was. I, I, like I'm saying, I was 21, 22 years old. I was very young. I had not, I was sheltered. I had not experienced those things. And that was some of our guest norm. So when you were on the Jerry Springer show, had it already been kind of in production for a while or were you on there kind of at the beginning or was it already kind of a known property at that point? Kind of the middle. I mean, I was okay. there pre 9-11. Okay. I actually worked on the show during 9-11. I was there when people were calling the 1-800-96-Jerry number. Gotcha. So- I was there before internet leads. Once we started getting internet leads, I was like, wow, are we going to be able to book stories this way? Now, probably I would say all casting is done that way. When right, I worked right. for... America's Got Talent, we were scouring YouTube for undiscovered talent. At the time, we had carts of people that had called into the show. We had binders full of people. And if you have ever called the show, they will never lose your number. We will call you and see if there's an update story or if you know somebody that's as crazy as you, we will never leave you alone. So we had some fun there. What you're saying is there was no shortage of crazy, basically, right? You just, uh, the phone just rang every day with a weird story and you got to pick and choose the best, the craziest of the crazies. Exactly. Yes, I definitely had my favorites and people that I kept up with, you know, for 20 years. Yeah, I don't think a lot of people recognize this, but Jerry Springer, uh, first of all, God rest his soul. I mean, yes, he just yes. passed away not long ago, and I, I understand it might have been pancreatic cancer. I think so. Oh, my gosh. When I interviewed him about a year ago, I had no idea, like literally zero idea. And I think that it just happened very suddenly. Yeah. It was like a silent killer. Like, I think he found out potentially like a month before. Oh, like, Oh, yeah. It, there's actually a celebration of life happening like this coming week in Cincinnati, which is crazy. Yeah, once you're diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, it, it, it is, it's pretty quick. I, I've known a few people that way. And it's very sad, but, you know, he, he was a character. I'd listened to him many, many times just do different interviews. And say what you will about that guy. He seemed like the most genuine person you've ever met. Oh, he was smart. He was kind. He was a legend. I, I have a lot of respect for the guy. Yeah, I... Uh, I read some stuff just about the show in general and uh, the, the website Mental Floss. They had 12 facts about the Jerry Springer show. Um, and again, because we're in Ohio, I thought this was interesting. The first season was taped in Cincinnati, and that was back in 1991. I didn't realize it was that long. He was brought in to replace Phil Donahue, <laughs> which when I think about Phil Donahue, I'm thinking when I was a little kid, but I guess Phil Donahue had a pretty long run too. Yeah, Jerry actually worked at the same station. He yes. was a newscaster. He was an Emmy-winning newscaster, and th- he was brought in as his replacement. Exactly. And, and I read that um, when he started doing the show, two news anchors quit because Jerry ah. Springer was on their news show, and it, it kind of bothered them, which is funny now because, I mean, it, as crazy as that show was, could you imagine somebody quitting their job over it now? I think times have changed a little bit. I can actually because there were multiple times where I interviewed places after having worked there and people said, you might want to change your resume to say that you worked for Universal or that you worked for NBC. Oh, that stinks. Yeah. And what I learned later was that the people that say those kinds of things are really not the people that you want to work for anyway. But when I was early in my career, I was definitely a people pleaser and I was just trying to get my foot in any entertainment door. So I did put up with some of that. But I mean, in fairness, Rena, I have to tell you, I looked at your resume, prostitute wrangler for the Jerry Springer show, probably not really the title you want to have. (laughs) 
Yeah, I, I have done some of that. And, you know, I, I came from Kentucky. My dad worked in a factory. I didn't ever feel judgmental of the people that were on the show. And that's actually one thing that I loved about Gary, too. I never really felt like he considered himself to be better than others. And that's something that I think is so special about him. No, I agree. I mean, the dude just seemed very genuine. Um, another one of those uh, facts that you should know about the Jerry Springer show. And I did not know this, but were you involved at all with his movie? I mean, he had a movie called Ringmaster. Were you familiar with this? That was right before me. Yeah, I, I know people that were involved in it. <laughs> did you know he won an award? I didn't know that he won an award for it. <laughs> he sure did. He got the Razzie Award for the worst <laughs> new star. <laughs> I think they're jealous. He capitalized on being the worst show in the history of television, too. He, he, he was good at it. Idol with pride. Absolutely. Hey, when, when Austin Powers is uh, doing a mockumentary of your show, I, I think you're up there. The guy did so many things, and... Even when I got to interview him a year ago, I said that he like I feel like there's nothing that he didn't accomplish. There was an opera. He's had a book. He's had a television show. He had a court show. What is legacy? And he said, really, it boils down to wanting a good life for his family. Right. He didn't talk so much about his personal life, but that's really what it's about in the end. Well, and he seemed very, um, and you know, I can't use this word so much anymore, but liberal in the classic sense, like whatever, whatever oh, yeah. anybody wants to do, that's that's their business. And I always respected that in him. He definitely was very nonjudgmental, very much a Democrat. He actually, you know, I, I think his dream is very much politics. And he talked about politics a lot on his own podcast. I said he was the mayor of Cincinnati before you know, his television career. Before he wrote the bad check. Right. Yeah, he, he, was, he was the mayor. He was a smart guy until the very end, very knowledgeable. But what made him famous was throwing the chairs. I mean, his ratings were in the toilet until then. Right. Yeah. Oh, that just and, and I'm sure that had to be such a wonderful kind of incident where you're like thinking, oh, okay, so people grabbed a hold of that. That's fantastic. Yeah. I mean... I know you were only really there for a short period of time as far as the history of the show goes, but in that short period of time, is there one episode that stands out where people would think there's no way that's real, but it was absolutely the guest, everything about them was legitimate. Is there just one that maybe stands out? Oh, of course. The one that got me promoted was a 14 year old girl that called into the show and she said, I caught my grandmother in bed with my boyfriend Ooh. and she was pregnant by him she suspected that the mother slept with him too. And I booked the 14 year old, the 18 year old boyfriend, the mother and the grandmother, the mom was on like house arrest. And we sent a limo to pick up the entire family in Georgia to drive them to Chicago. I was like, keep the lights on, pretend like you're there. Yeah. We'll be right there. Oh, wow. Um, That's so awesome. that, was, that was a show that was, a story that went the entire show and the way that that unfolded was crazy. I could not believe the range of emotion there from the grandmother admitting to it to the punk 18, you know, 18 yeah. year old boyfriend admitting to it and him kind of being speechless and blaming it on alcohol. And it, it was wild. Oh yeah. So I, I have to ask you this too, because we're in the business of talking to people and I know you also have uh, podcast things, but for the Jerry Springer show, did you have to go out and pound the pavement or did you just have to pick up the answering machine and find out who's in line? Great question. Yes. Yeah. So something that was not in the job description is if we couldn't get booked, yes, I did have to go out and pound the pavement. I did find myself going to strip clubs, talking to strippers, attending jello wrestling nights, calling midgets that are listed online, transsexuals. I thought you looked familiar. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, some weeks were easier than others to get booked. And that's why it's also really important to keep up relationships because if you had a great guest and they know other great guests or if they own a strip club or if they are connected to fans of the show, then that makes your life easier. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, one of the episodes I read about the Springer show, and you got to keep in mind too, Jerry Springer was big 
kind of in a weird spot of my life because uh, I was too busy, so busy like working and going to school that daytime TV just wasn't happening for me. So I'm reading some of this stuff going, you've got to be kidding me. Evidently the episode where uh, it was a little controversial because it may have dealt with bestiality. Um, I married a horse. That's the one, the <laughs> British person that married the horse and uh, called it his wife. Let me tell you, that guy died of a strange disease, and there were Polaroids. So oh my that's God. all I'll say to that. And I worked for the producer that booked that story. <laughs> oh, my yeah. gosh. That guy was legitimately out there. <laughs> Not only was he out there, but, you know, he's flaunting breaking the law as well. I mean, it's not like being across the pond is that far away. I didn't think about that, but I saw the Polaroids and was definitely surprised. (laughs) You've (laughs) never forgotten them? Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, there were, again, other things that went beyond the job description too. There was this guy who ended up on Howard Stern. We booked him first. I think his name is Jeff Levy. And this guy had like a weird, I don't know, fetish where he liked to be thrown up on, where that actually turned him on. And we got a couple, I think, interns or maybe an associate producer drunk and paid them to do that (laughs) so we could film it. (laughs) Anything for the job. That's fantastic. Oh, that's great. Another thing was, you know, we've had nudists and strippers or uh, streakers, streakers, where, yeah, this this actually reminds me of, because I interviewed with Borat, I ended up working on Nanny 911 instead, but, you know, a lot of times we would just film crazy things and then ask for permission afterwards, to be honest, and, you know, I had a guy that got me in a lot of trouble, because he got naked, and he was humping NBC Tower, and doing that in the <laughs> elevator, and running out onto construction sites and the ice skating rink in Chicago. And I'm like young and new to the show and he's just uncontainable. You know what I mean? Like I wound that guy up and he just, I didn't know where that was going and I'm just following with the camera and I got in some trouble. Like people were threatening to call the police. Oh yeah. It's I always important. Not what we need. Always important to have an off switch. Over what you, you're showing, you know? Yeah, it's tough when you don't have an off switch on someone like that. You know, you've got to have something to uh, slow them down a little bit. I needed an off switch on multiple people. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Nanny 911, you- can, you, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that show? And, I mean, I'm already intrigued by just the, uh, the, the, the slight uh, introduction you gave us. Yeah, so that was amazing. You know, having worked at the Jerry Springer show, luckily – got me into the Producers Guild of America. So I applied to this guy for like a year and I think I either wore him down or finally I just got crazy and creative. It was like, well, Bill Clinton's no longer looking for interns. So this job sounds like fun. (laughs) And turned out he was like a big fan of Bill Clinton. So I ended up having an interview and then he asked me if I could start that night. So a lot of it was just timing. Um, So I took a job as a post-production supervisor And what I learned that was not in the job description is that was really just kind of like a production manager type of role where I had to make sure all the editors turned in their time cards. And if they didn't want to fill them out, I filled them out. And if additional crew had to stay extra, like if a episode got pulled and then we had a shorter turnaround, then I had to sometimes make editors coffee and I had to go to voiceover sessions and do circle takes and I had to go to the to the laybacks of the audio and there was just so many moving parts um but what it really boiled down to was sometimes even just being an extra pair of eyes for the editors that are going over and over these cuts you know they'd pull me into their edit bays and they're like hey what do you think of this like you've worked on the show now for three seasons right like what do you think about this and how it's unfolding and so that was kind of cool but I, I really learned where I was needed just by becoming friends with the editors. Oh, sure. They know where all the bodies are buried. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. And from there, I ended up working on a documentary with one of the people on the show. And I ended up going on to an MTV show. And it was really at the start of reality TV. So that was very exciting. 
Oh, you had to be in high demand at that point because there was a time when reality TV took off and everybody wanted in. MTV was knee deep in it. And then you had, you know, the major networks getting involved in it with all, uh, the all they all wanted in so it's bad. There were shows that were unwatchable, but it's okay because they were reality. Oh, here's one. So I worked on one show for E! And it was like a bunch of the different reality stars from all of these shows. So people from Real World and Road Rules and Survivor and all of these shows and all of these characters. So like Johnny Fairplay from Survivor and... Yeah. They all lived in a house together, and then they got the opportunity to star in, like, a B-movie, like a Hollywood feature. So we filmed them all living in a house together where that's where all the drama goes down, and then them trying to act in a real movie. So it was crazy. Um, and it was around-the-clock footage. We were filming them hooking up. The only place that there weren't cameras was in the bathroom. So, but you can obviously hear what goes on in the bathroom. Sure, it was right, just, right. It was total madness. I'm like, dude, this guy slept with three chicks in the house. There's only 10 people there. You know what I mean? Pretty good ratio. Yeah. Yeah. And then the end game of that show was just that at the end, whoever won got to be in the movie. Is that kind of how it finished? Or Uh, The movie was a direct to DVD. (laughs) Let's (laughs) just say that reality stars don't make Hollywood actors. So wait a minute. This wasn't Citizen Kane? (laughs) Yeah. Definitely not. <laughs> All the drama was in the house and then trying to act. And what's so interesting, too, is like sometimes when reality stars, when their shows end, they have a really hard time with that. Mm-hmm. So I saw some of that. That was interesting to me. I'm like, wow. And the lights, camera action and everything is over. Who are these people? What's their identity? Can they handle that? Um, I saw some dark moments. Oh, I'm sure. That was a different side of Hollywood for me. Well, you know, when and when you talk about reality in general, it, it usually doesn't have like this super long runway for the individuals in it. That's almost part of the, I don't know, the appeal. It's just a bunch of people right. in here, unless you're Flavor Flav, right? I mean, there, there's not a whole lot of personalities somebody wants to see long term. I, I personally am a huge uh, mixed martial arts fan. And when they came out with The Ultimate Fighter, the very first Uh season was phenomenal. And I thought it was interesting. Number one, they found out that um, they gained a huge market share of women to watch mixed martial arts because they needed some of the backstories on these fighters. Because without the backstories, it's just a couple of brutes going in there and knocking each other senseless. But when they knew the backstories and, oh, this person was poor and this person's parents died in a car wreck and, you know, all these things, they were emotionally invested in these things. But it's the same thing. If you go back and look at some of those early shows, some of those people who didn't have necessarily the the longest tenure of a, a fight record you know, they, they all end up in the same spot, either on drugs or in jail, because, you know, they they're, they were such a huge commodity for a short period of time, and then they were done. And you, you feel really sorry for some of those people, because that's tough to handle when you're in your, I don't know, early or mid-20s. It is. And and that's the thing, too, with, with the talk show. It's like everybody wants their 15 minutes of fame. Now everybody has their own show. Now anyone can create a a following on these social media platforms. So I feel like that's even been magnified, right? It's just a constant competition for eyeballs. Absolutely. It's not even a big deal if you have 25,000 followers anymore. Yeah, exactly. Well, I know we've talked a lot about, you know, the, the uh, different types of shows that you've been involved with, but I'm actually also very interested in one more thing. And that is, I know you have a podcast. And for all of the perverts that listen to us, and it's a lot of perverts, let me just tell you. <laughs> no. <laughs> your, your your show is called Better Call Daddy, and it is not it is. a perverted show, just so everyone understands. But, you know, one of the things that we like uh, on this podcast, we love to hear stories. And your podcast bills itself as a podcast for people who love stories. And I got to tell you, I listen to a few of your stories, and they're fantastic. I've really enjoyed it. I mean, what what... Tell us a little bit about your podcast and, uh, and and kind of what you've learned doing it over the, the time frame that you've been uh, doing that podcast. 
Thank you. Yeah. So my dad is my biggest fan, my biggest supporter, always who I call. And so I wanted to interview guests, kind of use my casting chops from my reality TV show days. And I thought it would be interesting if my dad could kind of give the final thought. He's always giving me great advice. And I was like, wow, that could be my legacy, my gift to the world is sharing my dad's wisdom. I mean, he's a solid guy. He's taken care of both of his parents. He stayed married to my mom for 40 plus years. He's got three daughters of his own. He's a grandfather. He ran a business for 40 plus years and was successful. All of those things I feel like are good lessons. And so like a good daughter does, I share stories with my dad and then he weighs in with his intergenerational wit. Absolutely. I, I listened to one of your episodes. Um, you were talking to a guy who was in the CIA and, mm -hmm. you know, first of all, I, I used to do some work with the CIA back in the day. And some of those folks, uh, they don't have the greatest senses of humor. This guy seemed to, you know, have a pretty, pretty solid grasp on, on his position in life. Um, but I, I thought it was interesting. He did homeschooling with his kids. To me, that's three hours of a story. I couldn't imagine homeschooling my kids. Now, I couldn't imagine going to my father and saying, hey, could you weigh in on this? I don't know about you, Chris. Oh, yeah, no, that was definitely a conversation that would no. never be had in my house. Our, our, my parents were old school. I was, like, raised by wolves. And if I even went to my dad to say, hey, I got this story, what do you think? He'd be like, uh, why don't you leave me alone? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that guest was Andy Bustamante, and I actually interviewed his wife as well right after I interviewed him, which was so interesting, too, because she and they met in the CIA. They started together on the same day, and they left on the same day. How interesting is that? Yeah, so, I heard that. I thought that that was super interesting, and she trusted him enough he, I think, was the one that came up with the idea of taking responsibility for the kids' education. He didn't want to leave it up to other people. He felt a great responsibility in bringing up the next generation because he didn't himself have that. I am both intrigued by that and also scared to death by that. Like, I... I you know, that's that's a fantastic thing that he's doing. God bless him. Um, anybody who doesn't maybe think the school is going to look after their kids as well as them, I'm, I'm all for that. But, oh, my gosh, I just couldn't imagine schooling my kids. There's so many social aspects that I fear they would miss out on. Um, although spending less time with me would probably benefit them, honestly. My, my son's over there shaking his head yes. I think what I took from that is that I need to be more involved. You can't just let the school have their own agenda. Like, you really need to check in with your kids. You really need to recognize the gifts in your kids. You need to have them share with you ideas that they have, talents that they want to pursue. And I might not have been, in the beginning, as involved with the school. I think as a new parent, I was very trusting. But now sure. having four... I realize you you have to you have to communicate with the school, you have to communicate with the teachers and knowing their expectations. You have to give pushback if you don't agree with the curriculum. You have to find additional resources. Like I said, if if your kids have other interests that don't go along with what this school is teaching. So I kind of got that out of it. And so with your background, if the administrators know you work for Jerry Springer, do they, um, if there's a problem, do they say, oh, no, Rena's coming in. We better, you know, lock down the chairs because uh, <laughs> she's going to be mad about how we, we taught our kids here. You know, it's funny. So with our first kid, we sent him to an Orthodox Jewish school that was a little bit more observant than we as parents were. And like you said, I was a Jerry Springer producer. My husband went to Berkeley. We're both questioners. And my son started questioning kind of their sheep mentality of mm -hmm. how they wanted him to be. That had and to go like, over really we well. Yeah. Yeah. How can we expect him to be sheep when we are definitely not that? And after interviewing 
more than one successful, you know, not only just the CIA couple, but another kid that I interviewed, Sam Weinstein. I mean, he sold his first company, I think, at 19 or 20. And he said he never felt like school was for him and that it wasn't individualized enough. And even though his friends and he got into good universities during the pandemic, like imagine being a college student during the pandemic, everybody's taking classes from home. So, and what he realized too, is like these, a lot of the teachers that were teaching him business principles weren't able to do as well in business as he was at 20. So then he's like, why am I taking advice from you when I'm able to do better than you financially? Am I just here for relationships? So gosh, having some of these conversations has definitely expanded my mind. Like, I don't even really know if university is the best option anymore. It's really depending on what you want to do. That's right. Yeah. If you're going to be a doctor or, or you're going to do something with the human body, you're going to have to do a lot of studying and understand that. And there are great curriculums to tell you that, but if you're going to do something that you're passionate about, I think school might slow you down. I, I agree. I 100% agree. I was talking to my son about that today. I, you know, he started his own YouTube channel. He knows how to do amazing presentations. He knows how to edit. And I give him the tools to do that. Because if you demonstrate talent in that area, I want to give you the best tools to learn. Exactly. We actually told our kids, you know, the same thing. I have three children. Um, my youngest is about to start college next year. My oldest is out of college and then one's almost done. But we told them all like, you know, we talk about college, but that isn't the end game. It doesn't have to be what the end game is. You know, just pick something that you want to do. And it maybe it's not going to college. Maybe it's you want to be a chef. OK, then we'll find a place where you can learn those skills or if you want to be a hairdresser, fair enough. Well, let's get you to the place to learn those skills. So it doesn't have to be college. It's just making sure that they have a passion about something and you put them in the best you know, situation to succeed with it. I don't know if you've ever had to hire an electrician lately, but they're expensive and they're doing, Oh yeah. you know, it's hard to get one. Right. For, for, if, if you're a good electrician, you can make a damn good living. Oh yeah. That's here in central Ohio. It's plumbers. You can't find a plumber to save nope. your life if you need something. Literally three or four weeks to get someone to come out. Exactly. Yeah, we exactly. So if one of my kids wants to do that and they have a talent in that area. I think that's entrepreneurship. Exactly. Absolutely. We, we interviewed um, somebody who's in the construction world and this isn't like a guy who's building homes. This is somebody who's doing construction outdoors, um, kind of like development and planning and things like that. And I asked him because he, he's a little older than me. And I said, you know, so ho, tell me about your crew, like how many people do you have? And he's like, yeah, yeah, we've got so many people on our crew. And I said, what's the average age? He said the average age was like 53. Right. So, wow. you know, that just tells you there's not enough people coming in. And some of that work is not for older people. I mean, I couldn't imagine, I'm achy now. I could not imagine, you know, being 60 years old and swinging a hammer for a living. So there's definitely going to be some opportunities out there for people who recognize, you know, maybe going to school isn't the best thing and getting a trade as long, as long as you like it, you've got the world by the tail. That's, that's the thing I, if I could impress upon any young people, find something you want to do, go do that. Don't let somebody tell you to go to school. I have tried many different verticals. Not only have I worked in TV, but I've worked in finance. I've worked in telecom. I've worked for influencers. I have tried many different things and lots of things are not in the job description, but I think it's important to see how you can apply your gifts and strengths to other areas and find different ways and different streams of income. Absolutely. And I'm just looking for something that is looking for a complete smart ass who's really sarcastic. Uh, you know, I, there's a million dollars there for me somewhere. I just haven't found it yet. Um <laughs> But I, I did want to ask you since you brought it up and, you know, I looked you up on uh, LinkedIn today and I thought it was kind of funny. You and I are in a couple of groups that are similar and I had to ask you about it. We're both in the Worldwide Contact Center Professionals and Executives in the Know and Call Center Experts for our Contact Center Professionals. Do you have some background in call center work? Yes, yeah, so I worked for a telecom company. My husband was working for the parent company, 
And then one of the subsidiaries was looking for like a program manager. But what that translates to, I mean, it was a totally made up title. What they had me do was reach out to people on LinkedIn and get them to come to lunch and learn events. Actually, that's where my love of LinkedIn began because I was like, wow, you can just type in somebody's position and the company that you want to connect with. So we wanted to, at the time, connect with Chicago-based companies and we wanted like chief financial officers or heads of customer experience. And I just reached out to those people and I said, hey, we're having a lunch and learn and here's what the speaker is speaking on, you know, free lunch. We, we are inviting people from this company and this company and we, you know, love to have you. And just by befriending people in that way, I was like, wow, you can get people to come to your events. And then I started documenting the behind the scenes of that. And at the time, I, I really was like having trouble like juggling, the, taking a train downtown Chicago and then making it back home to like get my kids on the bus. So I ended up taking those skills and transferring it over to the financial industry. And then it was like the same thing. Reach out to people all day long on LinkedIn. Tell them, you know, we're doing a steak dinner. Do you want to buy some fancy life insurance? And I started doing it for a financial firm for about a year and a half. And, and same thing. I started taking pictures of the events, showing that I'm filling up the room, showing that, you know, we're having it in a nice steakhouse. And I had CPAs and financial advisors from all over the U.S. wanting to co-sponsor these things with me. It was insane. Serena, so what was the end game of this, though? Because if you're giving out a free lunch, who's paying and are they collecting names? Like, what was the end game? Yeah, they're they're collecting names and they are all all they need to do is sell one big policy from one person out of 50 to 75 people and then it pays for the whole thing. So, it was it was a numbers game. That's yeah, interesting. these were big cases. Yeah. That's the thing though, you know, it took me about 6 to 8 months to wrap my head around the products that they were selling and whether these people really needed those types of policies and then once I figured out that they didn't really, it wasn't really what I wanted to be doing. And so then I kind of transferred those skills over into the entrepreneurial space. Actually, I had reached out to somebody on LinkedIn once my events started getting bigger. You know, they started off, they were like 25 people, then 50 people, then 70 people. And, you know, I had reached out to a girl who planned events for Gary V. And I said, you know, I, I'm putting on a bigger event and I know you do events of like 2,500. So it'd be awesome to hire you and help me do one of these bigger events. And then when she found out that I left that firm, she hired me back and I ended up helping her do sponsorship work, which again is like a numbers game. It's just reaching out to people who would be potentially good sponsors for that event. And a lot of people have heard of Gary V. So when you throw his name out, then people are interested. And uh, I booked a couple of sponsors, found my way to the event, and realized that I love the entrepreneurial space a lot more. Like, that felt a lot more value-aligned and more exciting and just kind of got me back into, like, production and working with influencers and that type of work. So what's next for you? <laughs> what's next for me? Well, I am currently producing a couple of healthcare podcasts along with my podcast. And I moved from Chicago to Texas this past year. So that was a huge adjustment after living in Chicago for about a decade. Um, so between producing my own show and producing a couple others and managing four children and doing, you know, coaching calls with other podcasters, I just want to continue to do that kind of work and get better at it. I have to interrupt for a second here. You said that you moved from Chicago to Texas, and it's been quite an adjustment. I got to say, I've heard you use the phrase y'all about 10 times, so I think you're adjusting pretty well. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that is something that I grew up saying. So the vernacular wasn't hard. It's just readjusting four children to a new school environment and selling a house and moving into a house here that wasn't the right fit and then having to move twice in six months oh boy. and then my husband starting a new job. That was a lot. So what part of Texas are you in ish roughly? We're in Houston. Okay. Yeah. We've got some family out in Houston. In fact, um, the people that we talk to who run the crime scene cleanup business in Houston. So, you know, if you come across a client crime scene, let me know. I can, uh, I can hook you up. That's really cool. I actually just talked to this 
lady Heidi Chance today. She was a guest on my show, and she was an undercover cop who rescued girls from trafficking. And a talent manager, screenwriter, friend of mine is working on a very major story like that and heard her story on my show and now wants to include her in another project. So I love when that kind of thing happens. Yeah. Isn't that great I when really, you can make those connections with yeah. people? Oh, yes. And so I would just love to be potentially a part of more live shoots. I love doing in-person interviews. I love co- collaborating with other creators and I do a lot of that. I connected with a girl off of Twitter. She messaged me and she was like, yeah, my dad was a collector of Elvis memorabilia. And when we moved here from China, he changed his name to Elvis and he changed my name to Shirley. So we're Elvis and Shirley and I'm a collector (laughs) and I have a whole like collector community. I was like, that's an interesting Uh, dad story. That old story. Yeah. yeah, It's been said a thousand times. I think the plot twist was, and we moved here from China. (laughs) (laughs) I know, right? Yeah. that. And so I met her in person. She took me to a plant convention. It was called PlantCon in Houston. That was pretty crazy. Um, I love being invited to things that I never would think to do. That was one of them. Elvis, you said. Elvis and Shirley. Her dad is Elvis (laughs) and she is Shirley. (laughs) I don't know why. This is way out, out of line here from what we were talking about, but a million years ago when I was brand new and I worked on the phones and I worked for a credit card company, I remember a uh, Asian guy call in and his name had like three X's in it. I, I could not pronounce it. I had no idea how to pronounce it. He was a super nice guy and he called in and I said, uh, how can I help you? And he said, I want to change my name. I, I, I've been in America now for like a year and a half and I want a more Americanized name because no one can pronounce my name. I bet you can't pronounce my name. And I said, uh, you're absolutely right. So you changed your name. He said, I sure did. And I said, okay, well, we're going to need the court order document, blah, 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 blah. So tell me, what's your new name? He said, Ringo. (laughs) I love it, right? That's so funny. (laughs) So, yeah, I guess Elvis, Ringo. uh, There's got to be a lot of people who uh, are maybe getting the wrong idea of Americanized names. Oh, man. I went to school with the Michael Jackson. I I think that's kind of mean to do to your kids, actually. (laughs) Yeah, let me tell you, uh, (laughs) since you brought it up, Chris is already (laughs) laughing. Uh, When I was a kid, again, I mentioned before I was raised by wolves. My parents were 40 when they had me, and they, I I was just that, you know, uh, mistake child. And as long as I wasn't thrown in jail and made it to school the next day, they pretty much let me do anything. We had uh, the only black kid in our neighborhood. This poor kid's name was Michael Jackson. There you go. You went (laughs) to It's like, yeah. Um, And and I'm trying to think about it. It, His parents, in fairness, they named him before Michael Jackson was famous. It was just pure, horrible coincidence that his name was Michael Jackson. (laughs) Yeah, the one I knew was the other way around. Like, his parents were actually fans. So I, I knew another girl, too, that, like, her parents I think were a big fan of like Erica Kane and so they named her after her like that all of my children star. oh gosh I know I'm like I thought about that in naming my children like my last name is Watts I knew I couldn't do Naomi you know that's right yeah (laughs) yeah well I'll, I'll never forget um I'm big into volunteering and I was volunteering for um this this group that would teach kids about business and I was in high school And we went to a grade school that was near my high school. And there was this beautiful little girl in the back of the classroom. She was in fourth grade. I was in 12th grade. And she had these huge dreadlocks and the biggest smile you could ever imagine. And I'm looking at her name tag. And for the life of me, I cannot figure out how the hell to say this name. I had no idea. And every time I asked a question um, during this junior achievement thing I had to do, her hand would go up and she's just smiling like crazy. And I thought, my God, I, I got to call on this girl because I'm, I'm going to be an ass if I don't call on her. She raises her hand every time. So I finally said, uh, you in the back there, what's your name? And she said it, Mokin' Jay. Oh, no. Like Smokin' Jay, smoking a joint. Her parents named her Mokin' Jay. And the funniest part of that story is I told some friends of ours the same story. And my friend uh, Scott married 
a lady who was a little bit younger than him. And I'm telling the story. She goes, oh, my God, that was my class. Moke and Jay was like one of my best friends. <laughs> what a small world. I know, right? That's nuts. Yeah, that's crazy. I, I definitely remember a few kids growing up where I even thought, like, how could your parents do that to you? Oh, like, yeah. There was a girl who her name was like Dee Dee Butt. I'm like, mm. <laughs> I mean, I know the Butt family was like successful or whatever, but I was like, you should have thought more about that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we had a guy in my high school. I guess I'll say his name. What's he going to do? Sue me? It's his name. His name was Dick Dickhouse. That was that was really smart. Um. And then that's uh, funny because we almost named our oldest Richard after my husband's grandfather, Richard. But a lot of times Richard goes by Dick. You got to think these through. That's right. So I was like, Dick Watts is not going to be good. No, no, I I knew uh, my friend's mom was an insurance person and she used to giggle all the time because one of her big clients, uh, the Delir family, they had a daughter named Crystal and her middle name was Shan. Oh, no. Yeah. Crystal <laughs> Chandelier. Now that's child abuse as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> oh, I think so. I definitely think so. So Rena, this is the time of the podcast where uh, I ask Chris, what did we learn today? Uh, yeah, I learned that if I play my cards right, I can date a girl, her mother, and her grandmother. Ah, good thinking. Good thinking. Um, I love that. And, and I'll tell you what I learned is... You know, I've had a lot of jobs, and no matter how challenging or how bad my job is, honestly, there's probably less than a 30% chance that I'm going to ever have to deal with bestiality. <laughs> so, uh, so Or taping a tranny. <laughs> <laughs> or taping a tranny, no matter how many times I ask to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rena, thank you very much for taking the time to meet with us today. Um, I already mentioned one time of your, your podcast. Could you give us a rundown again of, of the podcast that you're working on now? Yes, it's Better Call Daddy. I actually do call my dad pretty much every day. He is my support system. I wanted to share his wisdom with the world. If you need a dad, my dad has even offered to adopt some of the guests that have <laughs> shared their stories with him. So when in doubt, Better Call Daddy com. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Well, thank you again for taking the time to talk to us about uh, your past and your job history. And this is Scott McLaughlin. And I'm Chris Kiernan. Saying, we'll, we'll see, see you at work. work. Thank you for listening to the Not in the Job Description podcast. If you have a story you'd like to share, or if you'd like to be a guest on our podcast, please let us know by sending us an email with a brief description of your story to stories at notinthejob.com. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more crazy stories, make sure you follow us wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on our social media, including Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, Rumble, Instagram, and YouTube.